Hi everyone, welcome back to another review. So I finally, finally managed to get a hold of a Ryzen 4000 series mini PC. I know a lot of you have been asking me to review Ryzen 4000 series, and this is it. The only one I could get hold of. I managed to buy this here, the ASUS PN50. It's the Ryzen 5 4500U model. Now there is higher spec models out there. There's the Ryzen 7, which I actually wanted, the 4700U with eight cores and eight threads, or the 4800U, so this model, the 4500U, it has six cores, and that's it, it's not actually multi-threaded, but it does have some very, very good performance. This particular little mini PC can actually run four monitors, and if you do have one of those flash 8K TVs, you can even run 8K at 30 frames per second from the main display port on this one as well. So we need to supply RAM, SSD, and an operating system because this is a bare bones model. But in this review, I'll show you how to do that. It's actually very simple. Even your grandmother could install the components in this and get herself set up and running. So you can see the mini PC there, very good size, packaged up quite nicely. We'll take a look at what we get in here. It's gonna be the power supply and, okay, a bit of paperwork and they've got a driver CD here. So this is a bare bones model and that means of course that there is absolutely no RAM operating system or SSD included. And lots of little bags here with screws. So the screws parts for mounting, of course, probably the Visa mount and your SSD inside. This looks like the uh, NVMe screw that we're going to need for that drive to screw it into place. And I'll show you how to do so in this video. Power supply is absolutely tiny, as you can see, which is really good. Now this is a 65 watt power supply. And here we have the power cable. So this one is an EU one because I ended up buying this from Amazon here in Spain. And here are some screws there. This is for the Visa mount bracket, which we have right here in the box. But let's take a look now at the design of the PN50. So Azus has been using this design for quite some time here, and it's very good. Look at the size of this. Look at the size compared to, say, my Switch Lite here. Very, very small, really nice and compact. So at the front here, we've got a lot of ports on this, and it's good to see that they still have microphones in here. If you ask someone that actually uses Cortana, you need the microphone in the unit. You're just gonna plug in, say, a webcam that doesn't have a mic. We've got it there, dual array microphones. So micro SD card slot here. Now we do have Gen 2 USB 3.2. We've got two of them in total. So one here at the front. So this outputs 4K60. This is via using the Type-C to display port 1.4. So it's 4K60 means it's display port 1.4A. Got an infrared receiver here for using a remote. And this is USB 3.2, but Gen 1 right here and a little status LED here for the hard drive activity, power on button, and on the sides, intake vent right here, but there is a lock slot too. If you wanted to use this as a point of sale machine, you can lock it down, which is great to see. And then the side, just another intake here too as well. So the top of it has this material with a bit of a texture on the plastic. I'm not happy that they actually put this sticker on here, corporate stable, some sort of three year guarantee but why did they have to actually stick it on here and the HDMI sticker as well? I prefer not to have that. But hey, that's just me. You might not actually mind. Gigabit LAN here, another two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports. That's Gen 2 Type-C right here. Display port 1.4A. So that is, again, 4K60, another 4K60. So this is where this really excels this particular machine. We can run four 4K60 monitors with this, which is absolutely great for such a small, compact machine. Here is the power in, of course, for that barrel connector. And this is an exit vent here for hot air. Now, in my time using this, I've already had a bit of a time on with it doing some tests. The fan noise is actually pretty good, but I will cover that in this in-depth review. And then along the bottom right here, intake vent, and I'm gonna open it up now and I'll show you how to install your components. I've actually just removed them all now for the purposes of this video. So these are the components that I will be installing. So you're gonna need some RAM. Now it needs to be 3.2 gigahertz DDR4 spec. And I've got two sticks here of 16 gigabytes. So I'm gonna be running 32 in total at that 3.2 gigahertz. And then my drive, well, I'm gonna install an NVMe here. This is two terabytes, a Sabrent drive. So good performance from that particular drive. And that's gonna really help out with the benchmarks I'm gonna show you. We'll be really at the maximum possible performance that you can expect from this unit. So here you can see I've undone the bolts here and this is a simple slide to the left and it comes out, you'll see it's quite a good design and the build quality is excellent with the PN50 here. And there are the two mounting points for that Visa bracket. So slide this out here and you'll see why they've gone with this design because when you slide it out, which is sometimes a little bit difficult, there we go, it's come loose. It's because the SATA 
or the SATA connector right here. And what happens is you screw the 2.5 inch drives onto this backing plate right here, slide that into place and you are done. It connects up then. So it's a quite a good way of doing it. Now installing RAM, if you've never worked on a PC or actually a laptop, because this is laptop memory, SODIMM, that it is very simple. So you need to just line up the memory, push it into the slot here, press down, you should hear a clip and this should clip into place. So that clip there is now secure. And the same for the top one, very, very simple to do. It is not easy, not hard should I say, for anyone to be able to do this, install these components. So now the drive, the drive is a little bit more trickier because there's not a lot of space around here to get to that screw. So our NVMe PCIe slot is just hidden under uh, this little board right here we have for the front ports there, the display port. And a little tricky to show you on camera, it's right there, so you need to just line it up as well. Okay, like so, push it in, you'll hear it clip into place, and then you simply have one screw, that little tiny screw that's in a packet inside the box, that's that one I showed you before, and simply then just screw that down into place. And because I'm doing this on camera, I've got my tripod in the way. It's too awkward for me to actually do it. So it's very simple. You screw that in place, and then of course you need to load on your OS, your operating system, and all of that. But we'll start out, I'll show you the BIOS first with this particular mini PC. So our BIOS does seem to be quite locked down. We don't have any real advanced settings that are of any use. Nothing really, because when you go under them, even under the APM configuration, there's really not a lot that we can change here apart from this handy setting, which is if you were to run this as say a file server, some sort of media server, and when the power is on, you want it to automatically power on, then simply go and just change that to power on or the last state, depending on what you want. So that is one handy option right there. The other is under monitor, we have a CPU fan control. This is really the only thing that we can change. So we have a normal mode, we've got a quiet mode, and then a performance mode. And this is just adjusting those fan profiles. So when it gets a little bit hotter, the fan will be a little bit more louder on the performance mode. It could, in theory, give us a little bit more performance. And on the normal mode, so far on my testing, the fan noise is actually very, very good. So I'm going to just leave that as default on the normal mode for the entirety of this particular review here. So let's jump into Windows now, which I do have set up, of course. All right, so up and running, and the drivers I've updated to make sure I'm on the latest AMD drivers, latest Intel drivers for the Wi-Fi card as well. And the range and reception on the wireless has been great. No issues with Bluetooth 5 that I've also tested out. Now, if we have a look at the device manager, we do have that AX200 card. I briefly showed it when we looked at the internals. You can upgrade it. If there is a later upgrade that can come out that's a little bit faster, then you can swap it over. Or you could put, say, a Realtek card in there if you want to do some sort of hack and dosh build or something. But I just recommend leaving it alone. This card is faster than the gigabit LAN port on here. It's really good. I'm getting some amazing transfer speeds from it. About 1,500 megabits per second uh, on average. Sometimes, well, it drops down to about 13 after a little while, but still... Very good. I'm quite close to my Wi-Fi 6 router, so that's definitely helping, but excellent. And the latency on that is also very, very good. The newer generation Wi-Fi 6 uh, definitely lives up to the hype. Very good. So the Ryzen 5 is on board in this one, but we have Ryzen 3 model, a Ryzen 7 model as well, with 8 cores and 16 threads. Now, this is the only one I could buy and get hold of at the time of this video. So we have 6 threads and six cores, that's it. So it's just the six cores with this one, all right? So the performance multitasking won't be as good as those others, but it is still actually very, very good, and I feel decent and respectable for the price of it. Maximum turbo is four gigahertz, and it's based on a seven nanometer process. So some scores here. First off, I'll show you that Sabrent drive too. So that one, as expected, the NVMe slot is performing as it should, good speeds. And it's PCI 3 spec, of course, on this, okay? We don't have PCI 4 SSD support in these yet. That'll be probably maybe next year, the next gen, of course. And the micro SD card slot. This is probably my only real con with this machine, and it's not that much of a con probably for most people. It doesn't support the high speed cards, okay? So it's not a ultra high speed reader. This one is capping out about 40 megabytes per second. So I would like to see a little bit faster because my SanDisk Extreme Pro micro SD can peak up to about 110. So it's, I'm not getting those speeds, which is a bit of a shame there. That's really the only thing there. It's very, very minor. Now, Cinebench R15 score, very good. 920 CB is actually good for just six cores. That's fine. Okay, the eight cores, some of the eight threaded machines out there will be a little bit faster, but that is good. And you'll see with Cinebench R20 that it 
actually can better some of the Intels, all right? So that last gaming laptop I looked at in the channel and I reviewed, which was the Redmi G gaming laptop with the Core i5, the 10300H. This one is actually faster. Now that has four cores and eight threads. This with well just six cores can actually better it. So that is an impressive feat. The AMD, they really have pushed ahead. And of course, as you probably know, Intel is playing a bit of catch up. They've got the Tiger Lake coming with improved integrated graphics uh, on the CPU side, not so much really. And what about a few other scores here? So I did run, of course, Geekbench 5. Again, for six cores, this is a good score, I feel. I'm impressed with that performance there. And Geekbench 4 as well, if this is still relevant to you. Now, these benchmarks I'm showing you, you can download them onto your own hardware, run them, and you get a very rough idea, good idea actually, of what kind of performance you can expect if you plan to buy one of these, if it's an upgrade or actually a downgrade for you. So Night Raid, this is a 3D Mark benchmark that is recommended for integrated graphics. And that is actually a very good score. This is going to beat the Intels out there with that integrated graphics score, because as you'll see later on when I show some gaming performance, it does actually perform really well. So I won't show you a couple of things like just its standard computing, okay? Documents and spreadsheets are blazing fast on this machine, or Windows performance in general, very, very good. But I will just cover a couple of my demo files here for video. So this is 140 megabits per second, 4K 10-bit HEVC, absolutely flawless performance. So this is a very good mini PC media playback machine, a bit of a powerhouse really for it perhaps a little bit of an overkill, it plays even 4K 60 HDR, fine, no problems, no lag there. So throw any video files at it and it's just gonna be able to play it with ease and, and the GPU doesn't get stressed out. Fan noise right now, I mean, I can't even hear this thing. I think the fan's off. I think it turns off or it runs on a super low RPM that you just simply cannot hear it. So I've been benchmarking a lot gaming, I wanted to talk a little bit about the temperatures. So it will peak for a few seconds, split seconds or so, at 93 degrees C. And this has happened to me a couple of times when running benchmarks only. Normal kind of use, I don't see anywhere near that kind of temperature. And so I think the thermals are actually good. It doesn't run into thermal throttling. Now I know 93 is getting up there. Ideally I wouldn't like to, I always want to see under 90. But I think 93 in this instant, it's okay. It just seems to be the fan RPM takes a little bit too long when it finally catches up cools it right down, but the cooling is actually very good on this particular machine here, not a problem. Now the power usage from the wall, I am seeing idle right now, very good, uh, 7.2 to about 6.3 watts idle right now, just running a wireless mouse and keyboard, I've only got one thing plugged into the USB, peak, I am seeing 48 watts, okay, so we're still well within what that particular power supply can put out at 65 watts, and I think you're going to be fine. So power usage, idle, really good. So a low-powered server, it can be run on a switch as well because it can automatically power on from that BIOS setting I showed you. So that is very good. So let's have a look now at 4K video editing and export times. So overall, this performance, with it set to the playback resolution at a quarter here, quarter resolution, Fine, there is no noticeable real lag. The timeline seems to perform great. But bear in mind here, this timeline is super basic. I am, however, using files here that are 4K 30, 100 megabit ones here from my Sony camera. So they are a little bit heavier than, say, using a lower bit rate. And you can see a bit of a delay then. Now, if you set it to full playback resolution, that's when I notice that sometimes it starts to get a little bit laggy. Now, if you're starting to color grade, you're grading your videos, which I do with my new ones now, uh, you will notice then the performance really starts to drop off. If you add more layers, a lot more transitions into the timeline, and your video is going to be quite long, and you're using, say, 60 different files or something, the integrated graphics, the Vega, six cores there, starts to really bog down, hits about 100% load. So for basic 4K editing, it's good. I say, yep, go for it, thumbs up. But anything more complicated than just basic editing, you do need a dedicated GPU. Just want to make that clear. Let's have a look at the export times now. Adobe have really improved things now, and finally they are supporting uh, the AMD Ryzen's, the newer ones, the 4000 series. So the YouTube preset right here, 4K. And I'm going to hit uh, OK on the timer right here as well. So I got a couple of things that that's not going to really affect performance, but close them off in the background. I don't want anything really open here. Uh, not even files and not even edge. Close that. 
So hit start, export, and whoa, almost. I could have made this one minute of footage, of course. More or less, about a minute of footage, and we shall see just how long it's going to take because this should be very, very quick. There we go, one minute and 24 seconds. Okay, let's do that again. Almost a bit of a blunder there. So start, export. Okay, blazing quick. This will be well under a minute, and this is to be expected. The performance, even with just six cores, I mean, six cores is plenty for most people's tasks, but even exporting 4K video, 100 megabit video into the YouTube preset, which I believe is 40 or 50 megabits, I think it's the bit rate they use. This is looking good. Oh, just under a minute, I think. We're going to scrape here. So I'm going to hit pause as soon as the progress bar here completely disappears. So it's about to finish. So there we go, approximately, I would say 53 seconds for one minute of footage. Bear in mind, it's not color graded or anything like that, a very basic edit. That's excellent, that is good. So export times 4K are very good. And let's get on to something a little bit more fun, less boring, a bit of gaming here now. All right, so it is time now for some terrible Counter-Strike gameplay from me here because I'm useless at this game. I, I just don't play it and, and it really does show. So the frame rate, we are looking over 100 frames per second, but I have seen it dip down to about 60 at times. So it's not always gonna be perfect. Now I do have it on the lowest possible settings and even those flames there and the smoke doesn't seem to be causing too much lag, which is great. And yeah, I managed to actually get a fluke kill there. It doesn't normally happen for me. I'm normally dead by now. So doing okay. And again, that smoke is having, a, now it's having a bit of an impact. You can see 60 frames per second now. So I'm gonna risk to just run out here and see if I can get a few kills. Whoops, I panicked there and ah, of course I'm dead. I shouldn't have just held down the trigger. So overall, pretty good. I think that's okay. That's probably the best I've actually seen this game run on, of course, integrated graphics on such a tiny little mini PC. So this is GTA 5 now with a 1080p resolution set, and I'm on normal settings, which is, you can say, about in the middle there with the settings bar. I could stick it on a higher quality, but I'm going to keep it at normal because we're getting just over 50 frames per second, up towards 60. I mean, the highest I've probably seen it when there's not a lot to render is about, uh, actually spiking to peaking at about 65 frames per second, and it will drop down to about 45 or so. The occasional little frame dip, but this, like just now, see how that dipped right down because of the bridge? But overall, this is impressive performance considering, okay, it's an old title, but this is integrated graphics, and I'm able to play 1080p Grand Theft Auto like this. And very briefly to touch on our Linux support here, that yes, I booted it up, tested it, and Linux does actually run just fine on this particular machine because we don't have a touch screen. We don't have to worry about any display drivers or anything like that. It's gonna be perfect, no problems. Just make sure you go for a new distro that does support the newer AX200 wireless adapter that's in this. So this review is gonna sound like uh, these guys here sponsored me, but Azus hasn't sponsored me, okay? I bought this uh, unit myself, but it really is a fantastic, awesome little mini PC here. I've got the six core mid-range version, and it really does have a lot of power. The Vega 6 graphics for integrated graphics performs great, as you saw from that gaming performance. Okay, that was just light titles. Don't expect to be able to play, say, Call of Duty on the ultra high settings because you're gonna get then about 10 frames per second. It's not for that, but still a bit of light gaming and older titles will be perfectly fine on this particular machine. Now, fan noise is impressive on this. Most of the time when it's running, it is barely making any noise at all. I thought the fan was off, but putting my ear down to it, I can hear a very small, faint little hum there, and you know that it's running, but it's a very low RPM. Power consumption is great. So I'm seeing about six to seven watts only on this. A peak of about 49 watts also is excellent. So that's really good to see. And then the fan at maximum fan noise isn't irritating like it can be on some other units. You will hear it, you'll hear it humming away, but it's not a bothersome kind of noise, at least not to my ears. Wireless performance is excellent from the AX200 Wi-Fi 6. So make sure you do have a Wi-Fi 6 router. You don't need it. But if you do have it, you can take advantage of those really good transfer speeds, and they are really excellent. Bluetooth 5 is on board as well. It can run four displays at 4K 60, which is an impressive feat for such a tiny little machine here. 
build quality is excellent. And of course you do need to supply your own components if you get the bare bones configuration. Now my cons here are very, very, very minor here. I'm nitpicking, I'm really struggling, okay? My complaints are this, micro SD card reader should be and support UHS one or two spec would have been great to see so you can run higher speed cards and actually get into the benefit of having the higher, more expensive cards. And very minor things like there's no HDMI cable in the box. So it would have been nice to include one, at least one cable, because some people might not have one lying around or a display port cable. Who knows, it should have been in there. And really that is about it in terms of complaints. Oh, and the price. It could be a little bit cheaper, I feel. I think just if it was maybe 30, 40 US cheaper would be then an ideal perfect price. So thank you so much for watching this in-depth detailed review of the ASUS PN50. This is the Ryzen 5 model, an excellent PC, mini PC that definitely gets my thumbs up.